Okay, let's start uh, the, the journey through McKim, Mead, and White, and not just McKim, Mead, and White, but McKim, Mead, and White, and Newport, and not just McKim, Mead, and White, and Newport, but McKim, Mead, and White in the Catherine K neighborhood. In the Gilded Age, we're seeing uh, a segment. It doesn't tell the whole story, but it certainly tells the story of a group of people who have accumulated a very large amount of money and want to enjoy that by having summer homes here in Newport, creating large palatial, or in some cases not that large. Early on, um, it, was, it was more of a, a true summer colony. It was people escaping the heat uh, of either Boston or New York or Philadelphia that were finding their way to Newport and Jamestown to uh, have two months of, of wonderful uh, weather like that we're enjoying today. So as we look at architecture, we are certainly looking at the style, uh, the, the artistry, the proportion uh, of, of each of these buildings. But we will also be thinking about and talking about, you know, what it means to design a, a building as relatively humble as Bellino and how uh, one or two houses away, but 20 years away, uh, Oakwood uh, for George King built in 1901 shows what a remarkable change, sea change has really occurred within the broader society, within the thinking of both uh, McKim, Mead, and White, and also of their clients, what they're looking for, what they want, what they're demanding. Here we have the very earliest, uh, one of the earliest maps of Newport called the Blaskowitz map of 1777. So this is um, soon after uh, the British have taken possession of this deep water port that is Newport. Um, you have to remember that in 1776, Newport was the fifth largest city in America. And people are like, wow, that is amazing. So we were just behind New York, Boston, Philadelphia. We were a large city, uh, a city of over 10,000 people, which was very large at that time. Because of this magnificent deep water port, right off the ocean routes connecting uh, Charleston and Boston along the Atlantic coast, uh, but a, a wonderful deep protected harbor protected by the foot of, of um, the lower section of Newport. So it literally couldn't have been better designed uh, for early trading and port purposes than it was because it, it just met every single need and it had a lovely spring, a freshwater spring located right here on Spring Street, which uh, is, uh, they weren't very creative in their names, but they were very accurate. And, but you can see that the uh, early development of Newport was largely in what we call the Easton Point area here. Um, and this will all be infilled later. Uh, and this is the site of um, the visitor center. And all that low lying uh, area that sometimes floods when, when the, the seas are high all occurred there because it was once an open area. Here we have Long Wharf, which extends out into the sea and then all the way to Washington Square connecting um, the, uh, the brick market here and the colony house here, which is really the spine of commercial and civic. Uh, so the, 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 the commerce and then the government of not just Newport, but Rhode Island at that point. And in the colony house, we have the country's oldest existing state house. So we're we're very proud here in Newport of our oldest and um, longest. You can see here uh, the evolution of Newport 
through time. So uh, 1776 was a, a real high point for us. Um, we were the fifth largest city uh, in America. Unfortunately, the British uh, also realized that this was an important port and they took possession of the city in December of 1776 uh, and held on to it for uh, about two years. That was a very difficult two years. A lot of new porters uh, left town in anticipation and we're seeing what's happening in Ukraine right now. It's, it's not so different. The signs were on the horizon that war was coming a uh, declaration was made from the steps of the colony house and half of the people hearing it were siding with the British and half the people hearing it were siding with the Americans. And so there was a, a great schism. That town uh, largely emptied out, became about 5,000 people um, uh, by the end of the, uh, the British occupation and it never we never really recovered uh, in terms of the, the um, being a major center of commerce. Again, we became centers of other things, centers of sailing, centers of gentility, centers of resort style living, but in terms of scale and being a, a major economic power as we had been during the colonial period, that was not to be. But you can see there was still some slow migration. It was a much smaller growth. And uh, I like to say that uh, Newport is the uh, beneficiary of benevolent neglect. We were never so rich that we tore everything down like New York. And we were never so poor that things fell down like they have in Detroit and, and other locations. So we always sort of just managed to hold on to our colonial uh, era buildings. And uh, I, I wasn't here in the 60s and 70s, but I hear that many of the houses in the point were painted with paint that had been smuggled off of the, uh, the base. So every house looked like battleship gray, uh, but that paint protected the wood and kept those houses in good enough shape so that when Operation Clabbered and Doris Duke uh, took an interest in them. There was still something there to, to restore. You can see slowly the kind of emanation out from that central point in historic hill area, slowly up the hill, and then in the 1880s down Bellevue Avenue to this location. This is largely a, a very kind of upscale um, real estate development by John Smith, a, a, new, a Newporter who saw that Newport was going to be a desirable place, acquired lots of land and then parceled it out to um, very wealthy people who wanted to build grand houses like the one that we're in right now. So uh, here we have um, 1884. Uh, so here you can see even along um, Bellevue Avenue, uh, it's, it's still not that dense. And the whole uh, Catherine K area uh, is, is, although developing, uh, is, is not so dense that the Sanborn Insurance Company felt it necessary to document all the, the buildings in that area. So I'm now going to page back to 1896. So this is the one that, that should be next. You can now see how the, in, in that 12 year period between 84 and 96, how much development had occurred and how much more um, it, it was necessary to document that Catherine K area than it had been previously. This is uh, 1896. So what you're seeing here is the uh, kind of mid gilded age development of the Catherine K neighborhood. And so starting around 1870, 1860, what had been uh, kind of genteel farms, almost like what Portsmouth had been 30 or 40 years ago, uh, they were slowly being subdivided 
and built upon many of the old houses, uh, like the Daniel Swinburne house at 6 Reno, uh, which is uh, an 1860s house, uh, begin to be surrounded by 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s houses. But you can see that uh, we've kind of patched together all of these, these uh, different maps to show how there's almost kind of little villages, if you will, that are slowly growing together until they become, uh, you know, the, the city of Newport as we know it now. So that area um, is changing. Here we have the very famous uh, 1878 uh, Galton Hoy um, etching, uh, which uh, is available in the Library of Congress at a high resolution. You can see the development along Bellevue Avenue. Ocean Avenue is still yet to be developed. This whole area is just basically a large rural area. But you do have here the Catherine uh, K neighborhood, and here it is enlarged. And what's amazing about this etching is, of course, it was completely created from somebody's careful study of each of these houses. It's an artificial view. Nobody went up into a balloon for 400 hours to carefully draw out all of these houses. But as you see these individual houses, you not only see the roofs, you see the individual windows. So the craziness of how much time it must have taken to create this very, very accurate map, because you can tell it's accurate because those buildings, which are still expressed in this, in this uh, image, are accurate to, to quite a degree. So even those buildings which are, are no longer here, we can take with some uh, assurity that this is an actual uh, honest representation of what Newport was in 1878. But you can see that uh, you know Middletown is, is largely unoccupied. Even Eustis Avenue uh, is, is, is largely empty. And everybody kind of wants to be as close to Newport, that is uh, Fame Street and Broadway as possible, because um, even at, 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 at a, a relatively high level, having horses and a car carriage, you know, that was really a luxury item which not everybody had. A lot of people were still walking, walking to the store, walking home, walking to church, walking to uh, the Redwood Library to, to read a book. So the, the, the desire to kind of um, develop closely around this kind of urban center of Broadway and then Bellevue Avenue is, is in, so intense that even the attraction of this reservoir, uh, at, which had once been a kind of an inland pond, is, is relatively thin. And you see a few kind of grand estates uh, occupying this, this area. But really, for the most part, um, the density uh, is still a, ahead of this 1878 time period. And then here, uh, 1903, you see the development all the way down to Eustis Avenue, um, but still a, a, a relatively sparse development um, in that area over the top of the hill and down. And then here we are again, 20 years later, and all of that neighborhood has now infilled. So all of the, many of the big estates have been divided up smaller buildings, but the buildings that we're going to see are, are really kind of part of that first uh, development in the, in the 1880 to uh, um, 1900 period. So uh, You'll see here in red uh, the six sites that we are going to be talking about. So it's really a, a great density of uh, building in a very small area, and as we're going to show, over a very short time. The first of the buildings is uh, 18, 
76. And the last of the buildings, I believe, is, is 1901. So we're just talking about a 25 year period, uh, which um, passes very quickly, as all of us can probably attest. Okay, here we have a much larger uh, view of that little area and uh, different parcel sizes. So we're going to be talking about some big buildings, uh, some grand buildings. We're going to be talking about a few uh, pretty modest small buildings in the, in the form of Bellino, that, that gray um, square on uh, red cross. And you, you notice that obviously they're, they're really kind of on these two axes. One, uh, Old Beach, which of course was Beach Road uh, before Memorial kind of took preeminence and created an easier road down. So this was uh, a, a main road of its, of its time period before um, traffic was kind of moved uh, uh, so southward to the memorial, the newly constructed Memorial Boulevard. And so you have some rather grand houses along that. Okay, let's start even in a way before McKim, Mead and White. Uh, here we have a Queen Anne style, uh, Queen Anne Revival style building called the Catherine Prescott Wormley building. 17, excuse me, 1876, uh, designed by Charles Fallon McKim. Uh, he is noteworthy as the second uh, architect, uh, American architect to study and sort of graduate from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, which was the preeminent school of architecture in the world. There was no doubt about it at that time. Nobody made any claims to the contrary. Um, it was the center of, of culture uh, for several hundred years and um, sponsored by the, the uh, kings of um, France and made uh, really to be the place where people who wanted to establish themselves uh, went. The very first person, as we may remember, and also somebody who did a lot of work here in Newport was um, Richard Morris Hunt. And uh, he was really, he um, came from a well-to-do New England family. Um, his father died young. He and his family emigrated to Europe uh, at where he learned to speak French. And so he was fluent in French and made his studying at the Cole very easy, but he had always kind of seen himself as American. And soon after his um, completion of the, the classes at the Ecole, he migrated back to Newport and uh, built uh, a home for the Griswolds, JNA Griswold House, um, 1864. It's now the Newport Art Museum. Now we're going to go just uh, a, a very short distance um, to what many, and certainly Vincent Scully, saw as the great flowering of American architecture. You're going to see a lot of similarities with the, the house that you just saw, um, but you're, you're going to see it in a, in a kind of a different form. Uh, here we are looking at the Samuel Tilton House of 1880. So we're looking just four years later. This is at the end of Sunnyside. Um, uh, the lower picture is what you see from the roadway, which is a little dead end street off of um, Old Beach Road. And it looks like a very modest, small, Cottage. It was for a, a Boston um, businessman. Uh, so, in some ways, it's actually playing down its grandeur. It's it's by seeing the 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 end of the gable, it gives itself more of an understated quality. But you have 
uh, a lot of creativity in that, uh, although it's hard to see and we'll be able to see it better when we actually visit it, there's what they call Pebble Dash, which is a kind of a concrete, but with, instead of stones pressed into it, as would have been traditional, pieces of broken bottle had been in different colors pressed into the cement to create uh, forms. Kind of go through the house, through a series of uh, photos, and this is recently transacted. I don't know who bought the house, but I hope they love it as much as the, the past owners did, who really kept it and protected it as a, as a distinct and, and important work of art, which I think most architectural historians would agree. So you have this little bump out of a brick um, a foyer, a kind of a pre-foyer, just a place to knock off your boots, really. Um, and, and then you come in to the main, uh, the main entry foyer, which again has that kind of Queen Anne style feeling with the very, very large fireplace, um, which is, is symbolic from a traditional standpoint of the hearth, welcoming people to your home. It has a little bit of that colonial quality when every single room had to have its own fireplace because that was really the only way you could heat a house. There were no ductwork. There was no, uh, each, each room was, was heated itself. And so that, that hearth, that welcoming hearth, it was critical. But now you have, uh, it's mixed again now with, with things that look like sliding screens. And those of you that have visited um, the Isaac Bell House, this is its first cousin built at the same time by the same set of architects using the same style. Um, uh, Sanford White now is, is stepping into his own and taking up the mantle of the, the, the designer within this. And you can see they've used all kinds of interesting motifs uh, cut into the wood. Uh, vertical screens that look like they will expand across like Japanese uh, screens that are, are, are now just being found as the black ships from Newport are going, Perry is going to the Far East and bringing back images of these exotic places, these exotic architectures. Um, and that's already finding its way into um, the architecture of McKim, Mead, and White in these early 1880s houses. Um, here, beautiful articulation of wood. This is a more traditional kind of English paneled architecture. It's taking that same motif, but now translating it through this, this very creative, artistic uh, direction to give it much more of a feeling of um, uh, inventiveness. And certain features you'll see, for instance, and this is very true of the Isaac Bell House and this, you have this very grand stair at the bottom. And then as you get to the landing, it narrows to three or four feet. So it's not that it, it, you want four people going up the stair simultaneously as, as certainly would be allowed to this, to this uh, landing, but it's because it serves as a stage. So you as the lady of the house or the gentleman uh, come down onto the landing and then you arrive to your guests through this grand wide stair, which has widened not for a functional purpose, but for a psychological purpose of giving you a stage on which to, to join the party at, at just the right moment uh, on just the right evening. Um, the beautiful screen work is incredible. And as you will see over at the Isaac Bell House, they were pretty creative. So uh, they, they might have used uh, 
bedpans or, or decorative features from manufactured items that they could buy uh, off the street and reconvert and turn into something that looked magnificent. Uh, they might take spools that were meant for thread and string them together on posts to create screen work. So they were using the manufactured items, those things that were really driving the Gilded Age economics and translating them through creative use into these wonderful articulated uh, patterned pieces. And then again, here again, you have these, these heavy, heavy custom-made uh, hinges creating almost a decorative wall for, for your closet. So rather than the closet being hidden away, it's uh, on either side of the fireplace with these enormous decorative um, uh, but on the inside here, we'll keep continue to go through, uh, each of these rooms is really a almost like a music box and, uh, on its own. So here you have the dining room on top, and even the butler's pantry, the lowly but butler's pantry, where maybe the, the mistress of the house would occasionally go and the gentleman in the house would never be seen. Uh, the articulation of that with multiple different woods expressed in their natural form, allowed to juxtapose one another for their color alone is you know, a wonderful uh, quality. And you see certainly that in the, 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 the floors of um, First Hunt and then um, George Champlin Mason, and then McKim Mead and White, where they, they use the material as its own formal component in the design, juxtaposing one wood against another, not for um, purely functional, obviously one wood's gonna be harder than the other, but because they look interesting, interspersed uh, together and creating uh, patterns that are not painted, but are intrinsic to the buildings themselves. So um, here uh, you have the, the living room with the little uh, seating areas off to either side. Uh, and you have the, the um, mirror over the fireplace, that, uh, which is a typical classic feature. And yet you have four smaller mirrors emulating it around the outside. So you have reflectivity and light and the shape that is uh, first seen in the large scale and then in the smaller scales around it, creating that sense of almost like a wave where there's a splash and then a smaller splash and then a smaller splash still in the form of the ovals carved into the wood. So the motif is replicated, but at different scales to kind of add interest. And then as we were talking about the different, using the different species of wood, you see that in the ceiling of the music room, which is all the way, we'll go back. Um, this space here is the, is the music room, um, which is, only natural for a guy who who is in the business of of selling uh, sheet music and musical instruments. So obviously he must have had a strong connection to uh, musical artists, and he could put on performances here um, that are quite extraordinary. So when you when you look at this house here, I'm not sure how many of you would guess that this is an eight bedroom house. I wouldn't. It, it certainly conceals uh, its its size and is quite understated and elegant in its way. And as, as we've said, inventive, using motifs coming from the Far East, from other places, and then just being added almost magically by Sanford White into this building to create this wonderful um, true shingle style, which 
emerges almost perfectly from its, its uh, first initiation at the uh, Newport Casino. That's McKimmy and White's first project together. I have to say, if you're gonna do one first project, the Newport Casino at the beginning of the Gilded Age, where everybody is coming to that building as the center of social life in the community is a pretty good choice to make. And uh, it really, in its elegance, and its popularity certainly launched the firm. And uh, so what was a relatively small firm, uh, New York based, but really the th these three guys and probably a dozen assistants uh, working for them. Um, by the end of our story in uh, 1901, will be the largest firm in the world doing work around the country and getting the grandest plum projects in New York City. We talk about Boston, the Boston Public Library. That, uh, this building replicated 50 times would not fill up the Boston Public Library. It's such an enormous palazzo block of structure. So they prove themselves capable here in Newport, particularly in the in the uh, Catherine K neighborhood, and went on to uh, some extraordinary things thereafter. So um, we'll we'll sort of I think we'll end with this little jewel of a house just around the corner. Um, in a way, this is this is taking that that idea of the shingle style and distilling it down into its purest essence. This house is called Bellino, Little Villa. Um, and uh, it, it has that, that kind of corner Queen Anne turret with the, with the witch's hat. But gone are all of the paneling, all of the different colors, all of that sort of surface decoration that we associate with the Queen Anne Revival style. And this really, um, in a way, and being, again, 1882, so it's, it's really contemporaneous with the uh, Samuel um, Chilton house that we've just seen, except it's it's even more essential in its quality of just being a mass, a mass which is a square and a, and a, a cylinder and a cone, and those are added together to form this. And all of the decoration is in the articulation of the shingles around the outside. And it's uh, a, probably, it's certainly the smallest of the, the houses we're going to look at. Uh, the wing off to the right in the photo you're seeing was a was a, a a library added later, but this is maybe maybe a 4,500 square foot house. It's amazing that uh, McKinney and White were even designing houses of this scale. Uh, when you see the grandeur and size of the houses they they were designing soon thereafter, and not just houses. Uh, if any of you have been to the Columbia campus in New York, which is dozens of large buildings, they designed all of those buildings simultaneously and arranged them like the Acropolis as a, 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 a plateau for scholarship. So they weren't just getting one big building, they were designing 20 big buildings for a single client at a single time. But here in uh, Newport, we have the benefit of seeing them working in miniature, almost like writing a little haiku poem, if you will, uh, to architecture about this new understated elemental style, which would later be called the shingle style. 